you guys seen the health the safety and health training slide? Yes. Awesome. It's the only thing I ever when I do that, it's like, oh, it doesn't show you what you guys are seeing on Teams. <laughs> All right, so so basically, we're going to go over safety and health training um, from the VPP perspective and from the SHIMS perspective. Um, it's basically one of the four pillars of VPP, um, and and it's and and in just in general, it's one of the in a in a general SHIMS program. It, it's important to have really decent safety and health training. Um, almost all of our incidents that we investigate uh, usually come down to some component of, of failed training, um, whether it's, you know, I think the, the worst one I did was a failure to really train and, and enforce the use of lockout tag out. And that caused a major incident that caused a fatality. Um, but they also ranged the gamut of, of, you know, just not training well has caused a, a number of, of citations that didn't result in incident, incidents, but um, did result in, in, in citations. So like a good example would be um, during the pandemic, uh, one of the uh, healthcare places tried to implement a respiratory protection program. Um, and because they did it in a Ma you know, quick way in, in, in a panic because they were having an outbreak. Um, you could see in their training records and in interviewing their, their employees the the lack of of information that had been that hadn't been. The, you could see the information that hadn't been given, and you could just see the panic in the paperwork as it progressed from from a, a tiny outbreak to a larger outbreak. And and their their unfortunately their patients they had like forty four patient deaths and multiple um in, you know staff get sick fortunately none of them died but uh it was it, i interviewed 30 30 staff and and got one to be able to describe the proper way to put on a respirator and do a pressure check a uh, seal check um so they they just didn't train well and and failed miserably in, in getting that info to, info to their people and how to do the safe donning and doffing of their their PPE and everything. So the, the the I guess the gist of that story would be train early when you're not in the middle of an emergency, and that way it becomes second nature later on when you are having for especially for respirators, PPE, that kind of thing. So. Standards with annual training requirements for your employees, if your employees are exposed to the hazard that they cover are uh, noise exposure, HAZWOPER, which is hazardous waste operations, um, respiratory protection, control of hazardous energy, fire brigades. Uh, fire brigades have two training. One's an annual training for a general fire brigade, but if they have interior structural firing, uh, firefighting requirements, you have to do quarterly uh, training with them as well. Uh, I, our emergency brigade at the company I work for, we did a yearly training with the uh, the company that are the the county forest uh, fire the the county fire departments that we um, we worked with, and then in we did monthly training exercises at the at the facility as well, just to make sure we were up to snuff. Um, portable fire extinguishers require annual training. Um, Machine guarding, logging. If you are, uh, you're, you guys aren't going to be getting into logging, but if there, if you are a logging company, there's annual training for that. Electrical power generation, transmission and distribution, grain handling facilities, uh, expanded chemical standards, and bloodborne pathogens. So when I say the expanded chemical standards, there are a number. Um, hopefully you guys can avoid getting into them, uh, but like silica is an expanded chemical standard now. Um, lead, asbestos, both have expanded safety ha uh, um, chemicals or uh, expanded standards that deal with them. Uh, and then there's multiple carcinogens that have uh, expanded standards and also uh, cadmium now as, as a uh, expanded standard. 
So those annual training requirements in VPP, we'd actually expect you to have annual training on a number of other other programs, but these are the ones that just carry a, uh, an actual training requirement in the actual standard. Oops. Common trainings that need document you documentation. Um, not all the uh, not all the actual standards require documentation, uh, but in, in the VPP program, uh, we would expect you to document all your training. Uh, in and, and in the goods uh, safety and health management system, we also expect uh, documentation. Um, and when when I say that, we actually can evaluate your programs during an inspection, and if you have a good one, they we can give a discount out on on penalties. If uh, it, um, for for companies that are actually trying hard, uh, so you want to document as much as you can. Uh, personal protective equipment requires documentation. Has hazardous waste operations requires documentation. Forklift training. Uh, forklift training is a, another one that you will want to if you have a operator who has had an accident with this fork truck even just a minor, uh, something as minor as bumping a rack and damaging it slightly, they need to have documented retraining. Um, I walked into a printing facility once that had huge amounts of rack damage and someone had with a magic marker or a Sharpie written a date by each dent. Um, and when I asked about it, they said, oh, that's the date it was hit. And I'm like, okay. So I cited them. I'm like, first off, you know, how was it hit? And, oh, a fork truck hit it. Yeah, like, okay, so I need to see retraining for that fork truck driver for all you know, for these incidents, documentation of that training. Plus, I ended up citing them um, and had visual documentation of them not fixing the racks for up to 12 years <laughs> uh, by their dates and, and, and with, with employer knowledge because it was the owner of the company going, oh, those are the dates the, rack were, the, rack, or the racks were hit. Um, so... But when you have a fork truck incident, document your retraining of that particular operator. Uh, process safety management has uh, di uh, huge amounts of documentation requirements. Uh, respiratory protection program needs uh, documentation. Permit uh, required confined spaces require documentation on training. Powered industrial trucks and then lockout tagout. So Dan, do you have anything comment on the annual and or the documentation? Yeah, I would just say to also remember <clears throat> that many of these trainings, if not m the vast majority of them, have a performance um, expectation as well. So like when we're talking about respiratory protection, there's actually a performance standard. Uh, they have to be able to prove that they can uh, don and doff the proper respirator, choose it, that sort of thing. For powered industrial trucks, there's a performance, um, you know, actually wit witnessing a person, you know, uh, properly operating that particular style of truck. So, so make sure when you're doing these trainings, and I really like these last couple of slides because it really does point it right out which ones absolutely need to be done, but make sure when you're doing these trainings, you uh, also consider the performance uh, part of it mm -hmm. as well, not just do a classroom and say there we're all trained exactly and hello melinda uh, so moving let's see here come on there we go so what constitutes documentation um you can be as simple as just uh, a blank sheet of paper with uh, the name of the trainer what got covered and names of the people taking it in a date or you can have, um, you know, a, a roster with everybody's test they took in a file for, say, hazard communications or or, or bloodborne pathogens and uh, that kind of thing. And and so it's just proof that you did the training, and in some cases, proof that that it was effective and that they learned something. Um, so it can be as simple as a, a blank sheet of paper with a few signatures and a title and a date and the trainer's name to elaborate. Um, you know, a sign off sheet with uh, a, a test attached to your records, that kind of thing. And then you can also do it online uh, and have everybody documented online. And just, the main thing is just so you can, 
in certain cases, make sure you're able to present that training to us or another um, agency if they, if they need it uh, when it's required. Dan? That's a good, that's a good slide. I, I like that. So really lays it right out. So nothing more to add. And then, so I'm just going to go over while we're talking about this. These next slides are taken directly from our application uh, uh, for VPP. Uh, but uh, what I'm emphasizing here is this this particular incident that the picture is, is focusing on literally stemmed from a training problem. The people doing the work did not understand. They, they not, none of them spoke English as a first language, and none of them understood the hazards of what they were working with. So, safety and health training needs to cover managerial, supervisory, and employee training, and with an emphasis on safety and health responsibilities. So, that's the expectation in VPP. You're 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 training your your people well in a good SHIM system or safety and health management system, same thing. You're, you're training your people well, making sure they understand their, their, the hazards they're working with and how to mitigate them. In this case, this was a um, cleaning process being done to a um, machine that uh, melts lipstick and pours it out into the little sticks that make lipstick go, um, you know, the little tubes that make uh, it, it, they'll pour it into that and then it can be uh, it solidifies and then it can uh, make it extrude from the tube. But to 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 do Girl, that, you're not they, an expert on lipstick. <laughs> what's that? You're not an expert on lipstick. <laughs> no, I'm not. But you know this they're pour they're basically extruding it into those tubes with this machine that's heated. Um, and what they were doing is cleaning it with 99.9% um, isopropyl alcohol because the lipstick has fat in it and it dissol uh, the alcohol cleans up the fat real well. Um, so what happened was uh, they did not lock the piece of equipment out and um, didn't understand the hazard of the alcohol very well. And the heating element for the lipstick melter was left on and it caught a paper towel on fire which then caused um, a small explosion because they threw the paper towel into a um, trash can that was full of paper towels wet with liquid uh, with ipa uh, or alcohol um, and so that burst into flames and these are the, the result was two melted tables which is what you see here in the front uh, the the main problem nobody was hurt uh, could have been some people hurt, um, but all of that melted plastic damaged a lot of product and cost them a lot of money. And all because nobody doing the job understood the hazards. Or So there was a hazard from the unlocked out um, machine plus the flammable solvent. So this is the drum of IPA they used. Um, Another issue they had was they weren't grounding things as they were transferring to secondary containers. Uh, but your your training programs in general need to um, cover the training use and maintenance of personal protective equipment. And grounding is actually a engineering control or something you would you would ground to protect yourself. Understanding why that's important to have in place is something that they missed entirely. Um, use of personal protective equipment. In this case, they didn't really use any gloves, which they were required to use. They didn't use a, they, the uh, MSDS sheet for IPA there uh, actually calls for a respirator to be used. Um, they were using a dust mask instead of a organic vapor respirator. And they didn't understand why they were still smelling fumes. So they didn't really understand their equipment either. Um, so, so training in personal protective equipment is more than just um, here, this is how you use your respirator. It's why you use it, what it's effective against. And, you know, we at the chemical company I worked with, we had probably 25 different types of gloves on site, all for different chemical use. And 
our procedures would call out in the batch records each when you went to load a chemical it would say okay you're using this suit with this glove and this type of respirator uh, to do this job and so my operators knew exactly what to wear and had been trained in how to use it and to our hazard assessments were done separately and we had those um, often signed off but then to make sure our operators were aware of it you know there was a sheet that said hey use this one this one and this one for this and there was no question about um, what you needed um, and if we didn't have that available for some reason we wouldn't proceed with that with that um, operation until we had the proper safety equipment but anything else to add, Dan? Yeah, this is a, a good slide. I think I <clears throat> had talked about this before when we showed it in the uh, in the in the uh, conference on Monday. But um, it's really important to uh, for the trainers to really understand. And I know it kind of goes without saying, but it is really important. Um, trainers should understand the subject matter. Uh, that they're training on um, you know they should understand it intimately so that they can come from a position of knowledge and um, you know answer any questions that are asked and and you know that sort of thing i think i think you know a lot of times we don't really pay attention to that a lot but it is you know it is really important yeah the uh and i you're Basically, you'd be surprised at the number of people just pencil whip training and, and don't. It, it really isn't isn't effective, which is one of the things we look for uh, when we're doing citations is effective training. So this is the uh, still from that explosion up in the left upper left corner. You can see the the fireball. And then you can see their area was nice and neat and clean. Um, so one of the things you have to to train for VPP is we expect a training in emergency preparedness drills, including annual evacuations. They did a perfect evacuation. If you the the fire alarm goes off, uh, the manager comes in, says everybody out, they leave. Now it would have probably helped them if somebody knew how to use a fire extinguisher, but you don't. You're not really required to train your people to use them if you don't want to require them to put out the fire. Um, they could have saved themselves probably about. Three million bucks worth of, of material with just the use of a single fire extinguisher. Because right after this explosion, it's it it basically is just a fire burning in a trash can, and then the trash can melts down completely. The fire spreads to those um, uh, particle board folding plastic tables and chairs and melts them all down. And so the only real damage to the facility was was soot which covered this entire nice clean area with a, a coating of nasty plastic and other chemical soot. And they ended up having to test all their raw materials and some and dispose of some of them. But so you need to train your people on emergency preparedness deals, including annual evacuations. That That is actual real drills. Um, the other thing you need to do is evaluate them to see if they're effective. And the main thing is make sure you're training your supervisory personnel to understand that if they're going to initiate the emergency drill or the emergency evacuation, it's it's it is an emergency. They can't like half half do it. Uh, we've issued a number of citations over the past seven years for partial evacuations where they consider it some sort of, of emergency, but they don't really want to stop operations. So they leave behind some people and it's either it's an emergency or it's not an emergency. <laughs> you know, there isn't an in-between. Um, anything to add, Dan? That's a good point. That's a, that's a really good point. When you're doing those drills, uh, treat them like full drills so that you can evaluate how things work in a in a realistic sense so yeah nothing more than that to add yeah i mean i the chemical company i would do we would do evacuation drills uh quarterly i believed and um one morning i was working 
and it was like right about 6:45, which is right about when everybody's coming on site. Um, and the alarm goes off and I was doing a temporary position where I was doing some computer uh, upgrades and wasn't out in production for a couple of months. But one of the office workers goes, well, the alarm's going off. She says, is this just a drill? Do we have to evacuate? I'm like, look, it's a quarter to seven in the morning. We're not going to have a drill at this time. This is real. <laughs> and what it was, was one of the guys had screwed up loading a, a palladium catalyst and it had blown blown out on several people uh, and coated them with with catalyst and catalyst actually catches fire with air some of them palladium in particular so these guys had lit themselves on fire fortunately none of them were badly burned but we initiated our emergency procedures and um, and now we had a thousand people to account for <laughs> Uh, but it could, and it could have got a lot worse. It it didn't, fortunately. It only affected two or three people, and they were wearing the proper PPE, so they weren't hurt badly. But um, because we practiced, people were able to do the evacuation perfectly. We accounted for all a thousand people, and it was done, you know, uh, in a quick manner. It's still messed up traffic on on the road on 55th Street, which was outside our plant site by quite a bit. I mean, we backed traffic up for probably two hours while we sorted this mess out, but the, the evacuation went with, without a hitch and, and everybody was accounted for, which you would think that's not easy to do with a thousand people, especially working from uh, the night shift at, at the place had about 60 people. The day shift had with contractors or close to a thousand thirty five people. Um, so evacuation drills, real training, and when it go when it does happen, hopefully it's just by by clockwork and, and you don't have a problem. And lastly, you need document uh, in VPP as we talked about before with the previous two sides. We'd spec documentation of all training received, including assessment procedures on that training. Um, in the sense of the explosion we've just been talking about, this was the extent of their documentation for lockout tagout, which is a sign on the wall that said unplug machines when cleaning, when not in use, and during maintenance. The training the people received, literally no one understood why they were doing it. So if you look back, go back to... This procedure, that sign that I'm showing in that last slide is off to the left side behind this desk. Uh, so it wasn't visible at the time of the explosion. Um, the people doing the work in the picture here, um, this lady here, um, very nice lady, speaks five languages. None of them are English well. Uh, in other words, English was her least good language of the five and she spoke French extremely well and a couple other languages ex extremely well, but um, English wasn't one of them uh, and Nepali wasn't one of them. So she's the supervisor. She's been helping train people. Her workers in that explosion off to the left are Nepali. Nice guy, uh, nice lady and a man. Both of them really good workers, had no clue of the hazards they were working with. Um, so they were trained by a lady who spoke French best, best they speak Nepali best. The manager was uh, a guy from Vermont. Um, and the other three people in the room that you don't see are, are French Canadians and they speak English okay. And uh, and um, their real language is, is Canadian, uh, French. Um, and, and they could, when I interviewed them, they could get by in English, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't the perfect language. So training at this facility should have been in Nepali, French, and French for the most part um, to cover the hazards at least. Um, and I mean, none of the workers were lazy. None of them were, you know, all, if they could have, had, if they had the information, I think they would have carried out their jobs perfectly fine without having a problem. It just, it wasn't, the hazards of the, uh, of the alcohol weren't really, made clear to them. Um, and, and most people don't, I mean, you go through life 
using a bunch of stuff that and you just don't realize how hazardous some things can be so i mean from when it comes to lockout tag out uh this just having a sign <laughs> is is not enough <laughs> but uh any any questions at all, at all uh this was a shorter a shorter presentation but i wanted to use some time to talk about the rest of uh, and answer any questions for over the whole week uh, of presentations so anything else to add dan yeah i think even though this was a you know a relatively short um presentation um you know training is training and communication is the conduit that good safety and health management systems are carried by and i think and and when we're thinking about how we do that you know there's the black and white sort of uh defined um parameters that the expectations are it's got to be done it's got to be documented there has to be a performance um, part of it um you know all those sorts of things but i think some of the some of the grayer areas that a lot of us are experiencing now um, have to do with like we had talked about earlier you know language barriers for um you know new populations of workers coming in um and uh and also cultural barriers too i think we talked a little bit about this on monday you know uh it's one thing for there to be you know just a, a strict language barrier like um not only not only uh a language barrier but that but the fact that a particular language may not have a particular word that um you know that suits the uh, meaning of the word that uh, identifies the hazard in the english language so that's an issue uh, but also uh, cultural differences as well you know um, people are coming from all over the world and all over the world is is not the same sort of culture that we see in america and i and i get into this discussion sometimes with ski areas because a lot of you know most every um piece of major equipment uh, purchased by ski areas is European, either Swedish or German. And, um, you know, their uh, measure of safety, while very similar to ours, is not the same. And there's some key things that, you know, these pieces of equipment come across uh, and not, and, and some things that they may not be, um, you know, they may not be compliant with. And, and, you know, I get the question of, you know, how do you expect us to know when we buy the machine brand new? Well, the fact of the matter is you really do have to know, and that's why you have to do an assessment. And the, um, you know, the folks doing that assessment have to be knowledgeable. And so uh, I think while, you know, safety and health training and the communication that goes along with it uh, is a relatively short topic, it is um, probably uh, one of the most important topics and it is the conduit that we provide the information that allows employees to make good decisions and good decisions um, certainly cuts down on one of the two uh, major causes of accidents right so unsafe acts and unsafe conditions and certainly if we have employees that are making good decisions um, we're cleaning up the unsafe acts and if they're knowledgeable and are able to tell us in a way that is you know that is um, documented and that we can follow through on uh, we're cleaning up the unsafe conditions and there you go mm -hmm. you know it, you're you're solving the the two most uh, the the only two actually the only two causes of accidents um, and you're addressing them in a very direct fashion so so i think you know uh it's a challenge it's something that we um have to really think about especially in a changing world and the changing dynamic of a world um but it's but it's uh certainly doable and i think uh you know uh, vosha project worksafe uh a bunch of different uh, uh safety and health consultants out there um you know interpretive services you know there's a bunch of 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 uh resources out there for um companies to be able to employers to be able to use to attack this issue and not and it's not going to be a one size fits all and i think you've heard us say that a few times with everything right nothing mm -hmm. is a one size fits all and i think um you know there's more than one solution to a problem there's more than one way to attack an issue and i think um you know keeping an open mind 
thinking outside the box, but also keeping those four core concepts that we've talked about to heart, um, evaluating everything against those concepts um, will, you know, be your roadmap, your roadmap to a good safety and health management system. And I can't, I can't uh, agree more with, with Dan. I mean, most of our, most, a, a large number of our investigations usually come down to a, a root cause of, tra of training being inadequate. Um, just a, 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 along with other things, but the, the real root cause tends to be you didn't train your guys well enough and something bad happened because of it. Um, the, any questions at all over this or the, the previous uh, three days of, of, of talks? Because I don't believe any of you, Melinda, Vanessa, and John, I know you weren't at the conference on Monday. Um, but uh, what we did, we actually, um, the con Monday conference, we talked about all this and we had a, a group a group discussion in the room for each presentation. And then since this was, a, I found that uh, online, I get less group participation. I, the, the, these are longer presentations than what we gave on Monday. But any questions at all, Vanessa, Melinda, John? Or any comments. <laughs> yeah, or and anything you'd like to see. Um, like I said, our commissioner liked this a lot. And if you'd like to see improvements or or uh, 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 changes, that let me know uh, either through email or over here. here. Yeah, I, I think you guys did a nice job on this. Um, I feel bad I haven't been able to uh, see all of these. Um, also, full disclosure, I, I didn't that you guys were doing this until Tuesday so um, some better marketing on this might have been might have been good to get this this information out so you can get better participation where do you get most of you so we we went through um, Vermont Safety and Health Council Vermont Vermont War, Vor, Vermont rural water um, VMEC um, I can direct email you. I have your email, John. But um, do you uh, what what safety places do you guys look at a lot? Um, there's a there's a lot of them. Um, you know, most of them are national. There's not too much that's local. A little bit. I thought I would have gotten one from uh, the safety council, but um, I don't know. Getting a, a lot of emails for sure. It's hard to. Oh yeah, sometimes. And, and Vanessa, I know you're working with Dylan, uh, and he was at the conference. Uh, oh, so okay. Did you actually hear about it from him, or how did you hear about it? Uh, he sent um, an email with Tuesday through Friday's trainings to the people on um, our safety pillar, and oh, invited awesome. a few other people. So, uh, with work schedules being the way they are right now, I was free to attend. So. Oh. Um, I joined as many as I could, as much as I could. I know I missed a little bit on, I think, Wednesday. This, honestly, for me, today's was probably where I got the most out of it because we have so many different cultures and people who speak different languages. I do feel it's important to have it for everybody and find a way to make sure people understand the hazards of their jobs and what their jobs actually require. Yeah, I mean, I've done... Like some of you may a few years back remember the Casello waste uh, chemical incident at the recycling center. Um, it involved uh, basically what happened was somebody threw a can of bear spray out in recycling and it went off. And basically the guys who do the recycling separation are in this like trailer with a conveyor belt and they sort. So it came up the conveyor belt and just sprayed a line of like 18 dudes with with uh, pepper spray and they had no idea what had happened so they did a full uh casella initiated their emergency procedure and did a full hazmat response well almost all of those employees who got sprayed were nepali and they didn't speak any english um, so i ended up interviewing them with an interpreter and casella actually had done training 
brought in a Nepali interpre interpreter and, and trained all of their employees in Nepali on um, on their on their uh, emergency procedures and a bunch of stuff. Now the guy still just because of cultural differences still had issues about understanding how things happen. Like they really had no clue as to why they were stripped naked, scrubbed down and sent to the hospital until after I started interviewing them and had and asked, you know, uh, I had learned from another investigation I had done that um, uh, refugee workers are really afraid of the government in, in a lot of cases. Um, and so, so um, yeah. it's also takes a whole lot of words to describe culture. Yes, yes. Well, actually, it's but, amazing the number well, right. of people that work in a hospital that are different culture. <laughs> the the uh, but their first question from the Nepali workers was, "What is bear spray?" Their second question is, "Why do Americans spray bears?" <laughs> and I'm I'm not making a joke either. That's exactly what their first two questions were. And then the second thing was, the third thing was, was why were we stripped naked and sent to the hospital? Because <laughs> they had no clue. <laughs> And uh, so the the main issue I, I found, we didn't cite Casella for it, but they didn't really have a, a, a supervisor who could really communicate well with their employees. Um, they were using a guy who sort of spoke English as sort of a, a, a daily work. You know, while they brought in an interpreter, they interpreted for trainings, they didn't have somebody who spoke both languages as well as a supervisor. Um, and we didn't cite him, but... That was the only issue. Their guys, they had a little bit of trouble getting their guys out just because of that language barrier. Uh, but they did get everybody out and, and treated properly. So any other questions? And Melinda, um, if you're interested in seeing any of the others, uh, our communications guy is posting all of these. Uh, they were recorded. And they're going to be up on our uh, website and on YouTube with links to YouTube. Uh, so you can always go back and look at some of them if you wanted to. And then feel free to email me anytime with any questions at all. Carl, why don't you put your email into the chat? Oh, yes. Yes, that's a good idea. Uh, a, a good initial start on this, guys. Um, uh, you know, something we can all add to and bring forward. Yeah. Next year, we're ta we, we've been doing some talk about having uh, Project WorkSafe involved um, and doing some joint stuff with uh, with with them. Um, yeah, and I think, and, and just to... Um, you know, just to extenuate a little bit what Carl um, was saying, you know, this is a this is our first sort of foray, and you know, we're kind of it's like we had a discussion yesterday uh, with our communications person, and you know, he was asking us how how we thought this went, and you know that sort of thing, and um, you know, I I told him I said you know we're we're kind of relearning this whole thing, you know, um, we're kind of we're kind of um, relearning uh, how to do compliance assistance. And and I think it's kind of exciting, actually. I, I think it's something that, you know, we're going to do more of. Um, you know, when I first, when I was, first became a CAS, it was stand in front of a crowd and talk for two hours. And, uh, and, and I think uh, that's, you know, that's still really valuable. But I think also there's a real uh, need for this sort of of uh, outreach in this format you know people aren't they don't have to travel they can they can you know it's much more convenient and uh, so i think there is a need and i think we're going to learn and continue to change and form new partnerships based on this and uh and i think you're going to see more of it from from Bosha for sure That's, and I, I i hope you do hey just a thing to look at that you guys are probably already looking at it looks like we're going to get some of the Afghani refugees. Yes. So, could, I'm, you know, somebody on your team probably will know where they may be working. Um, getting them some interpreters and some of, of safety interpretation is another whole, uh, another whole thing. Yeah, but, it's. Um, 
Actually, I think we'll have an easier time finding interpreter since the war went 20 years. We've got some guys that speak a little bit of Afghan uh, either pushed to it. I mean, I I took modern standard Arab in, uh, Arabic in college and they don't speak that, um, although that you can get by a little bit with it. Um, and, and I'm super rusty. Uh, matter of fact, I, I wouldn't even say I speak it anymore. Um, the um, but um, yeah, that my chief concern is where are they going to put them housing wise? Because the housing crisis around here is ridiculous. Because um, I mean, like um, one of our employers in Central Martin is having trouble finding people. There's a ready-made population that could be housed near there and and work, and I bet you they'd be great. Uh, but there's no place to put them, <laughs> you know. Yeah, if you could find, uh, uh, you know, maybe 500 nurses and maybe some mm -hmm. docs, that'd be great, too. Yeah, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? You guys should be uh, advertising down in, um, in uh, down south and say, look, you know, our guys aren't overworked because people, you know, aren't crazy. <laughs> uh, we're uh, overworked <laughs> for sure. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, but but at least our, we're not overrun with with people with COVID. I mean, we've got some, but we don't we're not like spilling into the streets with our patients at the moment. You know, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any any other questions? Well, I want to thank uh, everybody who came and John, thanks for your comments. And if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to email me as well. Uh, uh, if you'd like to see different subjects, uh, we can put on on pretty much anything. Um, and the nice thing about, from our Vosha perspective, is we see the stuff that went wrong, so we can provide you guys with examples. So you, you've you been doing safety trainings to people generally. Hopefully you don't have a lot of, of in-person examples of things going wrong, but where we can help you is say, you know, this is – why you need to train and this is what can happen if you don't train because uh, we we get to see that bad end of things um uh, actually one of the ski resorts approached me to to co-teach a couple of things with him so he can help change his culture a little bit because he's like you know i can emphasize it but you've got the horror stories and, and so we i can do the training and then you can say yeah this is why and show a picture of of what happens um because it I mean, I, when I worked as a supervisor, we didn't have a lot of incidents, but we we followed a lot of rules. And since I came to work for 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 Vosha, I've seen why a lot of those rules are in place. Yeah, if we, you know, tra as you said previously, you know, tracking those near misses mm -hmm. um, uh, as leading indicators. Um, uh, it's hard for people to understand that. Yes, but uh, statistically it works, and um, if there's a simple way to understand that, uh, we've got to figure out a way to communicate that. I think the main thing is getting your people culture culture good enough that people will don't aren't afraid of reporting a near miss, you know, and 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 going, hey, you know, I forgot to put my earplugs in when I went into this room, and and we need, maybe need a new sign or whatever. Uh, or, you know, with a, I think a lot of the, the problem is people are afraid to, 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 to report things and changing the culture to where they're not can get you to capture a lot of those, those leading indicators. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was really great to see everyone today. Have a good day.